Welcome everyone to what is perhaps one of the most important encounters in the career of 18-year-old Vincent Keimer. He takes on Magnus Carlsen and he had already won the first classical game of round 4 of the World Cup. Magnus arrives there on time. The clocks have started. Magnus has the white pieces and in a must-win situation, if he draws or loses, he's out of the tournament. In Magnus's entire career, he's won World Championships, Rapid Championships, Blitz Championships. He's won every Super Tournament. But if there's one title that is missing, it is the World Cup. And this time as well, he's on the brink of being eliminated. Vincent had beaten him in the first classical game. And now it remains to be seen if Magnus can make a comeback. He writes down his score sheet just like he always does. His clock is ticking down, but he's trying to get into the zone. Takes his time. Now will adjust all his pieces. First the pawns, then the rook, the knight, <laughs> bishop. And while all of this is happening, we have the game Pragnananda Nakamura in the background. Vincent waits calmly for Magnus to make his first move. 1 e4 it is. Vincent plays the super solid e5, a very good choice when a draw is fine for you. Knight comes out to f3 and Vincent plays his knight to c6. Keimer is one of the most well prepared youngsters in the world of chess. He has worked a lot on his chess with former world championship challenger Peter Lecko and openings is one of his strong points. You will see that when he's well prepared, he blitz out, blitz, blitzes out his moves. And here the knight comes out on f6, attacking the pawn. Now the main move here is castle. But you can see that Magnus has come with a plan, a strategy that he wants a rich strategic battle. And that's the reason why he goes for d3, keeping more pieces on the board. Bishop c5 is Vincent's approach. Now very important to note that you cannot win a free pawn here because queen d4 is a typical double attack in such a position. For Magnus here, the idea that he was angling for is bishop g5. Pinning the knight and telling black that maybe putting your bishop out here was a little bit too ambitious because now this pin is going to irritate you. Vincent asks the question to the bishop, Magnus moves his bishop away to h4. And now will Vincent go all out with the move g5? It's possible but then bishop g3 and, and there are some weaknesses. So he goes simply d6. Very solid move. And this position has not been played too many times before. And not at all tried at top level, but you can see that Magnus is kind of well prepared here. He goes for the move d4. And with this move, he is taking advantage of this pin in the position, hitting the bishop. So Vincent can take, but after knight takes on d4, he is putting pressure here. So he took it, knight takes, and here is an important point. If black were to take on d4, you mustn't take queen d4 because then after b5 it attacks the bishop and the queen. But rather you first take on c6, b takes c6 and then claim a small advantage with this. Anyway, going back to the game after knight takes d4 has happened, Vincent is now deciding what to do. One of the options is of course to take here but that gives white a small advantage and so you can actually sacrifice a pawn by castling or you can go bishop d7. Bishop d7 is Keimer's choice and a very solid option. Now the knight on d4 is hanging. So a good option was to take knight takes c6 but look at Magnus's choice. This is very important because now he's given up a bishop for a knight and created an imbalance on the board. Even though black has the bishop pair what Magnus essentially is saying is that you have doubled pawns and in such positions, I will try and outplay you. This is the idea. So knight comes out to c3 by Magnus. He, he defends the pawn on e4. 
and Vincent Castles. This is actually quite bold play. He's not really bothered about this pin here and he feels that the queen can eventually come out and there won't be any pin. Magnus plays his queen to d3 and uh, with this he is actually angling for a long castle. So that is an important move that Magnus has on his mind. And Vincent now has to decide how to continue. He plays his bishop to b4. Very interesting move. And somewhere, you know, there is all sorts of pressure here. This way, the knight is pressurizing the e4 point. Yes, there is a pin here, but it can always be broken with g5. And Magnus has to figure all this out. At the same time, he has to keep the position running. Look at how Magnus swivels that knight on e2. He brings his knight back and then defends his own knight. This is the toughest part when you're playing in a must-win game that you have to all the time keep avoiding the most objective ways of playing because that could lead to a very small advantage and uh, would not be enough to win. So you have to take practical chances. But if there's someone who's very good at doing that, then it's Magnus Carlsen and he goes for long castle. He, he plays it. This is now his king is relatively safe but could get into trouble because the b file is potentially open vincent puts more pressure on the e4 point now he has three pieces lined up against it and magnus simply defends it with his pawn and tells vincent that it feels like my position is better because i'm going to go g4 maybe move the bishop go g h4 g5 you know i'm going to play on the king side well but vincent has a good move here and he finds it queen e5 breaking the pin and also putting pressure here now a, a decent move in such a position is king b1 because see there are always these threats bishop c3 knight c3 and queen f4 check and you lose the bishop this is a loose piece here and so king b1 makes sense you will see that magnus here is thinking quite a bit and we've made some kind of a time lapse of the time he has thought. So that just shows the amount of time he thought for this move. All different postures, trying to figure out what is the best way to continue. And after nearly spending like 15 to 20 minutes on the clock, he finally came up with a move that cannot be described as anything less than terrible because now look at the bar it's just dropped down it's one of the maybe worst blunders that magnus has made because you take here now look at vincent it seems like he sees the winning move you can't take with the knight because check and the bishop drops if you take with the queen now comes the stunning move knight e4 and this is what magnus has missed if you take back, I take with the queen and I'm attacking two pieces, you can't save them, both. And if you take the queen here, I'll take with the rook and after pawn takes, again rook takes, attacks both. And black is completely winning here. So, and you know, Vincent only needs a draw. So it's not even like he needs anything more and Magnus has seen it. So he gets up from the board and goes away. He's, he's seen this. In a post-game interview, he mentioned that he had seen this when this happens so now vincent has to figure this out what is the way in which he should continue he takes it has vincent seen it that is the question now let's look at how magnus comes back and retains a poker face because this is his last chance he has to take with the queen you can't take with the knight as we just noticed queen f4 check and you lose the bishop look at magnus coming calmly takes with the queen He's eaten something and he's waiting now for Vincent to make his move and maybe he'll be eliminated for sure. If Vincent finds knight e4, there's no way Magnus stays back in Baku. And Vincent doesn't take it. And look at Magnus' expression. He can't believe it. Disbelief on his face. He just can't believe what Vincent has just done right now. 94 was so good he shakes his head and he's like wow i just came back from the dead i've dodged the bullet there he's shaking his head vincent actually 
either he cannot understand why Magnus is behaving this way or Vincent just saw 94 right now and he's like oh my god and that could be the worst thing that can happen to Vincent if he just saw 94 and he's like I missed that chance then it's not at all easy to make a comeback from there anyway now Vincent I mean his position is not at all bad it's equal and he needs a draw so his, everything is under control however Magnus was just about to you know be ready to call it a day in in this tournament and he would have he would have been knocked out but now he has fresh chances because position is equal and he has to keep playing and he goes g4 you can see Magnus still seems a bit shaken up by what just happened there Vincent plays his pawn up to f6 now what is the way in which Magnus should try and win this position because there are a lot of drawing tendencies especially because of the opposite colored bishops but one thing that we can all learn from this game is how Magnus slowly builds up the position it's not like he's winning or anything you know there, there is no thought of how to win this position it's more like how to reorganize the pieces so first he got his pawns here now next he got his bishop back and with this bishop coming here he's just putting it on a good diagonal it's not like he's aiming for f4 e5 anytime soon it's just improving the position bit by bit maybe he can go h4 h5 now you might wonder for example if magnus does play h4 here and he does that why wouldn't Magnus when the position was here go back with his bishop and then directly play h4 h5 why did he have to go h3 then bishop here and then h4 this is one of the key aspects of playing when when you are in a must win situation that you do not hurry you take it easy you sort of lengthen the game you you keep on making moves and somewhere your opponent will come under time trouble has to make a lot of decisions and Magnus is a true master at this you know now he pushes his pawn on h5 a committal decision and fixes the black pawns here and that could be an important thing because this is a g7 is on dark square you might you might wonder by but g7 is so difficult to attack like when are we ever going to reach it well not anytime soon but maybe in the end game so rook a d8 played by vincent magnus also brings his rook to the center of the board rook h on e1 and yes f4 e5 would be a very desirable break but the moment you play f4 the g4 pawn does get weakened so vincent also playing it easy he, he brings his bishop back on c8 and now the next plan here has to be thought how is Magnus progressing this knight on c3 doesn't look great but first Magnus improves his rook he brings it to d3 and perhaps at some point the rook could swing over here maybe enter the position that could be an idea or go to c3 after moving the knight there are many many such options we cannot really see Magnus's clock because of the light but Magnus has kept a very healthy lead in this match on the time bishop b7 now this next move by magnus is really very very interesting because how how to continue is a question where to put this knight is also a question but i think magnus has already seen his entire setup and this is one of the things that magnus excels in he knows where his pieces belong so knight b1 he feels that his knight should go to d2 and we'll we'll understand why Vincent goes c5 he opens up his bishop he's also relocated his bishop nicely and now you will see Magnus plays c4 with this he is weakening the d4 square bishop c6 played by Vincent but whenever the knight comes here the bishop can come and remove it now you will see b3 so what is Magnus's plan is that he's going to go knight d2 king c2 and that is just what small improvement there rook b8 
you will see Vincent putting pressure on the b3 pawn. But the knight can just come there and defend it. Oh, first he's planning to move the bishop. And again, a little improvement. The bishop, Magnus did not feel was doing much on g3. It was hitting here. So he wants to put it now on e3. Yes, Vincent can come in knight f4 and, and create some issues here. But Magnus will simply move his rook away. He goes rook b7. The idea is to put pressure on the b3 pawn. And Magnus develops his knight. The knight is now well positioned. So, bishop controls the d4 square. Knight controls here. Magnus has re reorganized some of his pieces. But in no way has he made any serious progress as yet. Bishop e3. Small improvement. Small steps to giant improvement. And how does Vincent continue? He goes king g8. He goes back with his king there and Magnus brings his king up, king c2. Both sides have some pawn breaks. Magnus mainly has f4 and e5. Vincent has a5, a4. But both are waiting. Knight d8 played by Vincent and a, and a logical move. The knight is well placed on f7 to stop both e5 and g5 breaks. Now Magnus takes this opportunity and plays f4. Very logical is to play knight f7 to stop e5. But Vincent goes a5. And this was this is very interesting. Now suddenly position gets sharp. And also look at Magnus' time of sharpening the position when it is move number 34. Vincent is under some time pressure. He has less than 5 minutes on the clock. And Magnus pushes e5. Now point here. Take, take, take. Bishop c5. Magnus is clearly better. You can't take on e5 twice. But Vincent takes it once. He first takes here. Magnus takes back. And now you can't, as we said, you can't take here. So Vincent goes knight to f7. And if you if you were to push your pawn to e6, after knight e5, this pawn would become very weak. So Magnus goes bishop f4. He is sort of defending everything with his rook. And if rook e8 is played, now e6 is very strong because there is no knight e5. So he goes d e, bishop takes e5 by Magnus and now here he plays his pawn to a4. Very very difficult now to take here. You will, you will realize that Magnus has found a brilliant idea. He goes bishop c3. A lot to learn from this. Because if you had taken here then uh, bishop a4 and the rooks would enter. But the way in which Magnus deals with it is this. Takes and now king b2. And notice how the b pawn becomes a shelter for the white king. The rooks have become sort of immobile because they can do nothing with their own pawn. But most importantly, the a pawn has become a passed pawn. There is no one to stop it. And this is Magnus's trump card in this position. This is the pawn which will help him in the game. Right now, it's under lock and key because the bishop looks at that square. But the way in which Magnus has created his chance is definitely amazing. It's just tremendous. Bishop takes on e8. Now, black is even a pawn up. If you count the number of pawns, black has five pawns, white has four. Also, this pawn could become a weakness. But now Magnus goes rook d5 and he wants to win his pawn here on c5. We have reached move number 40. So both players get additional 30 minutes on the clock. Now Vincent thought for a good 12 minutes and is now down to 19 minutes. Bishop c6 played. So with the bishop attacking the rook. If you take here, rook takes c5. Then the bishop comes back. And now the bishop is actually attacking this pawn and there is no way to defend it. So that was Vincent's idea to deflect the rook here and come back. Bishop comes up to d4. Very, very calm little move. And Magnus is actually hoping that this bishop goes away, wins a pawn, so that he can start pushing his pawn. So Vincent takes it. And now Magnus's pawn is finally free to move. It has one, two, three, four, five steps to go. But step number one achieved. It has moved to a4. And, and every step that that pawn takes, it's going to be dangerous. Knight g5 played. Now, Vincent wants to win another pawn here. But as we all know, for Magnus, the key is the a pawn. Bishop e3 played. 
he's looking here if you take bishop h5 then a5 rook b4 takes takes rook g5 and white is doing pretty well in this position so you don't want to be taking the h pawn here as vincent it is possible for sure but a good defensive move now is knight to f3 good move by vincent keimer uh, because he's trying to go into an opposite color a pure opposite colored bishop position getting rid of the knights and uh, you know if you want to keep the knights on the board it's not so easy because the rook comes in it puts pressure here and here the bishop will drop back and put pressure so i think magnus now again he has to see that what is the risk he wants to take and where is it that his winning chances are maximized he takes takes now black is a pawn up it's an opposite colored bishop position but still the a pawn is just a killer pawn but vincent has the only move to stay in the game now which is rook b4 and put the rook behind the pawn that will be helpful for him to stop the pawn and he finds it he is playing really well he finds this move rook b4 and now if if in case magnus gets tempted to take this pawn then rook a4 leads to a very good position for black so magnus goes bishop d2 finding the best move again magnus there and now rook has to go to a4 so rook behind the pawn here and also the bishop defending this vincent has sort of invested into a pawn he's given up his pawn in order to get this set up king takes in comes a check the position is still drawn it's very small edge for magnus but the margin of black's move that lead to a draw or less he goes c6 one of vincent's idea is that he wanted to put this bishop to defend the pawn but a better idea was to go g5 and start creating your own passer here but he goes c6 king d4 now the king is coming up and vincent plays his bishop to f3 defending the pawn on c6 and one of the ideas that magnus was a bit afraid of in such position is putting the bishop on d5 because then he cannot make progress however that will not work because after takes takes king takes this is a winning end game for magnus so bishop g2 was played and this is the final mistake in fact here he had to go bishop e2 and after rook c6 activate the king the position was still under black's control but the moment he goes bishop g2 now his idea is to come to f1 and magnus is now going to dominate this bishop he has to find the move rook f5 it cuts the king off it stops the bishop from coming here and also paves the path for king to come to b6 it's such a multi purpose move here rook f5 and you can see the spring in magnus's step there he knows he's now converting this rook f5 very powerful move stopping the bishop from coming to f1 to kind of coordinate with his rook and attack the c4 pawn vincent's moves are now very difficult it's almost impossible for him to hold this position he goes bishop h3 the arbiter comes in to give the new score sheets because the moves can only be written till move number 60 and then you need a new score sheet we are on move 54 now rook f4 played by magnus his rook now defends this pawn his bishop defends this pawn and the king is now ready to move in bishop e6 played and i think king c5 is in order here magnus quickly gets his king into the game he plays king to c5 and vincent goes rook a3 now this is a little irritating move because you can't move your bishop away from here you lose this pawn and if you keep moving your bishop on this diagonal i'll keep attacking it so he goes king b4 magnus hitting the rook but the question does remain how is he going to push the pawn down the board there are still three steps to go well turns out that you don't need to support the pawn you just need to remove the rook and now you will see the rook has no squares down the a file and the pawn is ready to push forward brilliant play by magnus you know sort of taking the long route bringing his king this way now vincent goes rookie 
moves his rook away and one step closer the a pawn the trump card of magnus's position is now doing its job it's moving towards becoming a queen bishop h3 played and now a7 a8 is the idea he goes a7 he pushes his pawn rook goes back to e8 and now magnus plays this nice little move rook e4 in order to get to the seventh rank because if you take the pawn is queening and so you have to go to a8 to stop the pawn he goes rook a8 and we can just enter into the position with rook e7 and this is the best move you can see Vincent knows that the writing is on the wall. Rook e7 played. The pawn is well protected. The king can slowly move in. But in fact, Magnus has found a faster way to win, which is to play rook b7 here and rook b8. Yes, he can win the pawn as well. Look, the g7 is hanging. But now with rook b7, it's more much better because when you go bishop g2 trying to defend here, I'll take on g7 with a check and you lose the bishop. So Vincent resigns the game. Magnus comes back in the match. 1-1 one, one is the score and we move to the tie breaks. What a game this was by Magnus. After that blunder where he was almost going to be knocked out from the tournament. Vincent not finding it. Then Magnus had this look of disbelief. He came back. He calmed himself down made little improving moves then that amazing idea of using his opponent's pawn as a shelter and creating his a passer bringing vincent down into some time pressure to make some critical decisions it was pure classy play by the world champion and now with both piece, both the players uh, you know putting back their pieces for tomorrow the arbiter has to do the toss for for tomorrow's rapids because who will get the white pieces and who will have the black? There you have the two pawns uh, with the arbiter and Magnus says let Vincent decide. But in the end he chooses the right hand and he gets white for game one. Vincent has black. Um, both of them confirm from the arbiter the rules of tomorrow's tie break because this is Magnus's first tie break at this World Cup. Two games of 25 plus 10, two games of 10 plus 10. Then two games of 5 plus 3 and even if the scores are tight then, then is a sudden death of 3 plus 2.